Welcome to the Porch Roof Classic, a retro baseball podcast novel in 15 or so episodes by Jeff Pullman. Episode 16. Big stupid surprise, Tosh would be friends with hippie weirdos, muttered Mick. I erupted and seized his t-shirt with the intention of planting him in the ground up to his midget torso. Danny and the Chicopee twins jumped in and quickly separated us. He didn't mean that, said Danny, yanking me away. You sure as hell did. Okay, maybe he did, but they were just dumb words. Didn't your criminal girlfriend just lecture us on that at Funland? I guess. So come on, let's settle this on the diamond like we said we would. It's still 22 to 22, chirped Robbie, checking the scorebook in his hand. Izzy's up first, bottom of the 12th. Everything about the game was suddenly bigger. Over 20 curious neighbors now watched. A gaggle of kids had climbed up on the roof to take the hippies' places. Even the elderly, rarely seen Bickersteins, had come out on their back porch to drink lemonades and peer at the game through their bushes. Izzy dunked in a cheap single, and I had to forget all about Helen when I batted next. Danny's pitches were just too scorching, though and I hit into a double play when the ball went right to Mick at first, and Izzy got caught wandering off the paper plate. I kicked the ground, livid, wanting to win this thing for Helen now, too. My fluffy pitches kept the Dannys at bay through the 13th, and then Danny did the same to us. The wind had all but stopped, but now giant moths swirled around and smothered the floodlights, causing a weird flickering effect on the field that didn't help anyone hit. Both teams went down rapidly, complained of dizziness. In the top of the 14th, Danny let off and blistered one of my pitches that for some reason failed to curve. The ball whizzed over a leaping jean and left, continued to rise, and skipped over the roof to the left of the kid gaggle. Arrgh! screamed Jean. I hung my head, couldn't even watch Danny strut around the bases. They put two more people on, but we squirreled out of the mess, thanks to a nice running grab by Izzy. Down to our final three outs once again. Izzy got a leadoff single in the bottom of the 14th. Me and Tomas both popped out, but Jesus imitated Clemente again and doubled to right center to score Izzy and retie the game. 23 all, bugled Robbie from the porch. No shit, said Mick. Face it, I hollered in Danny's direction. This crazy game's never going to end. Got that wrong, he said, because next inning we're scoring seven. With Jean at the plate, Danny then whirled and tried to nail Jesus at second with a surprise pickoff. Jesus somehow evaded Dan's tag, but landed weird on his back sneaker and dropped to the ground, howling. Tomas ran out to him with the rest of us, but the damage was done. His left ankle was twisted and swelling up. We helped him off the field and sat him down in front of the bushes. Somebody's got to run for him, said Danny. Give us a second, would you? Robbie came sprinting out from the porch at that moment with a cold can of 7-Up, fat scorebook under his armpit that was practically spilling digits. "'Who's coming in?' he asked as he handed the soda to wounded Jesus. I stared at him. Helen was being grilled in a state police barrack somewhere, and I was close to not caring any more about anything. "'How about you?' His jaw slacked. He nervously scratched his hair. Helen would be sending you in if she was managing, that's for sure. This remark made his face glow and his heart race. He seemed to grow a foot taller on the spot. Somebody has to score the game. Don't worry about that, I said, and took the scorebook from him. Get out to second base. He started for the field, and I yanked him back, whispered in his ear, Just be birdie. This made him really smile. He tightened his cap and dashed out to second. Come on, yelled Mick. We got 12 more innings to play. Izzy was due up. I glanced at Robbie's cryptic scorebook for a moment. He seemed to have a lot of hits, a lot of outs, or both. It's just a little bingle, Iz. That's all we need. Don't make me any more nervous, please, he replied. Look alive out there, Robbie kid, Gene screamed. My brother was low to the ground, left toe on second, but both feet spread wide apart. I wasn't sure if he was imitating Bertie or Lou Brock or Jackie Robinson but any of those would work. Izzy took the first pitch, which was way high. Out on second, 
Robbie had pulled down the bill of his cap so much I couldn't see his eyes. The moths were everywhere now, the entire yarn taking on a strobe light effect. Danny waved a few bugs away from his face, set himself, and threw again. Izzy swung and dribbled it out to the left of second. Robbie went right, then left, then right again, and broke for third. Izzy motored down the line and beat Mick's throw to first by inches. Me and Jean hollered with joy, then froze, because Robbie was tearing around third base. What are you doing? I screamed. Get back! Too late. The ball was zipped to Danny, already halfway to home. Stan ran in from left field. Robbie realized what he was doing, churned to a stop, and switched into reverse. Stan waved hysterically for the ball. Danny whipped it at him, but Stan tried for the tag before he had it, and the ball bounced off his glove and rolled behind him. Robbie didn't see this happen and was heading back to second. Go home, yelled most of the watching crowd, now including mom and dad on the porch. Mick was arriving at second and yelled for the elusive ball. Stan threw it toward him, but Robbie rolled, popped back up, and changed directions again. Mick, shouted Danny as he headed for third. Mick ran toward Robbie, the ball in his hand and venom in his eyes. At the last second, the ball, Danny, and the belly-flopping Robbie arrived at the upside-down Tupperware cover. Stan was also there, yelling for the ball, and Danny slammed into him. Robbie sprang back up, covered in dirt and grass and tag-free, and scampered home. By the time a furious Danny could react, my brother had crossed the plate and jumped into my waiting arms. We fell to the ground together in 24-23 to 23 triumph. Gene and Izzy and Tomas landed on top of us seconds later. Illegal substitution, we thought we heard Mick shout. Boo-hoo and get lost, yelled Izzy, and we hoisted an elated, sputtering Robbie up on our shoulders. My parents embraced on the porch, and I swore I could see tears in Mom's eyes through the screen. Danny had a reaction nobody expected. After he walked around in a small circle and cursed to himself, his fists clenched, then unclenched, he came up to me and jabbed my good arm. Ballsy battle, Tosh. See you at school. I exhaled and nodded back. The neighbor crowd began to dissipate, many of them patting me and Robbie on the back. Robbie had already skipped up to the scoreboard to post the glorious final score. After Danny and his sorrowful minions slunk back to their vehicles and drove off, I joined Robbie, Jean, Izzy, and the Amigos for some quick celebratory ice cream in the kitchen. We could sort of hear my dad on the phone in the other room, and our worry about Helen put a damper on the moment. Later, lying in bed with multiple emotions still racking through me, I heard Dad mutter to Mom in the bedroom and went into the hall to press my ear to their door. "'What do you mean they lost her?' asked Mom. "'I don't know. She got away from them somehow in the Marsh Meadows Station parking lot and ran into the woods. I'm telling you, if they could afford any damn police dogs in this town, they probably would have tracked her down by now.' I got back into bed, where the buzzing in my head had suddenly turned into thunderclaps because I knew where I'd be heading the next morning. Over cereal bowls, Robbie and I watched ourselves on the morning local news. Twelve seconds of badly edited fame, which morphed into an added twenty-six seconds of hippies being arrested footage. They didn't show my winning run, complained Robbie. Stupid crumb heads! They didn't even need to, Robbie. You know why? Why? Because I saw it, and I'll never forget it. He grinned at me. The Baltimore Orioles were a month away from winning the East, the League pennant, and the World Series, and it wouldn't bother him at all. I pedaled my bike out of the garage right after breakfast. Meadow Street was a good 20-minute ride from the house, and I made it in record time, my breath puffing out little steam clouds in the frosty dawn air. I found Bird's Nest Lane, rolled down its slope, and located the spot where Helen and I had ducked into the undergrowth. The sun wasn't fully up yet, and shadows darkened everything around me. I thought I could see the cave entrance, but wasn't sure. Helen? I whispered loudly. There was a faint twig snap in the darkness, then her soft, wounded voice. Joey? Hi. Keep talking. Over here. I slammed into a giant hanging branch with my face and ducked under it. Her white hand emerged from the shadows, clamped onto my arm, and drew me inside the little cave opening. We hugged for what felt like two minutes. She was clammy, her hair a long, ratty mess. I didn't know what my friends were up to, I swear. Chuck is such a child sometimes. I've seen him get all riled up at demonstrations and come close to punching cops. So is Chuck your boyfriend? 
No, we fooled around once, but he's half the smoocher you are, Joey. I laughed, and we proved that right there with a short kiss. How'd you get away from the cops? Lucky break, but now I gotta ditch town somehow. Did the Joeys win the game? Yep, 24 to 23, if you can believe it, and Robbie scored the winner in a rundown. Wow, that is so far out. She gazed into the cave space. Something wrong? She shrugged. Guess I was hoping you'd finish a close second and be like all heroic and unforgettable. You can be first and do that too, you know. I suppose. She stroked the back of my neck with her warm hand. I'm sure gonna miss you. Same here. Where will you go? Not freaking Newton, that's for sure. Or anywhere in New England. Gotta get that old thumb working. Someone told me if you stay on the Mass Pike going west, you end up in Seattle. That's true. Uh Uh-huh. Take my chances on a coast where no one knows me. As soon as I have a place to hunker in, I'll be sure to send you a letter. You better, I smiled, hopefully. Just make sure you tell Irv something good about what happened to me, she continued. Like I went, went to live with my sick grandma or joined the Peace Corps, whatever. I dig that guy. I can do that. A heavy silence fell between us. She squeezed my hand. Well, I should probably split before it gets too light out. There's an entrance to Route 91 near here. I can ride you on my bike. That might be a little goofy. Why don't I ride you? I had heard worse ideas. Five minutes later, she pedaled me up Meadow Street, early commuters into Springfield, passing us without a second glance. I had given Helen one of my spare Red Sox caps she could stuff her hair under, along with what little cash I had taken from my wallet at home, and sat perched on her lap and tried to avoid her pumping legs. On the other side of a traffic light, the street became an incline down to the river, where it joined Interstate 91 on its way to the Mass Pike. Because there didn't seem to be any marsh, meadow, or state cops around, Helen didn't feel nervous about using her thumb there. Thanks for the money, she said. I'll pay you back when I can. Oh, don't bother. And you can have that cap. We shared one final squeeze. Be careful, I said. You too. We were both choking up. Always fight the fight, Joey. And kick fear's ass? Every damn day. Even though Helen had become a permanent part of me, like an extra rib, I would never see or talk to her again. I waited a few minutes until a lady in a pickup truck braked and swung open the passenger door. Helen smiled at me one last time and climbed inside. Then I turned my bike around, hopped on, and rode straight out of summer. The bus to Marshmallow High School stopped at the corner of Nobby Hill and Pine, a few blocks down from Grove. I met Izzy and Jean there, along with some jittery-looking freshmen, and we swarmed to the back of the bus instinctively. I don't care what Danny said to you after the game, said Izzy. I'd be careful passing him in the hall for at least a week. I say a month, added Jean. The bus emptied out in front of the school, which size-wise looked like a state prison compared to the junior high. Izzy's new locker was just ten away from mine, and Jean's was around the corner. Mick went by fast and avoided eye contact for some reason, but we never saw Danny. I made it to my new homeroom on the second floor a minute or two late. The male teacher was in his thirties, had long mutton choppy sideburns, and wore striped pants and a green bow tie. He seemed kind of cool enough. He paced back and forth in front of the blackboard while he read off the attendance roll. My name was Fourth and after twenty or so more names, he said, Danny Blight? Silence. Everyone looked around, and we realized there was an empty seat in the back row, which was likely his. Blight going once, Blight going twice. Lucky me, I must have thought at the time. The bell rang soon after. The homeroom door opened, and a crisscross flood of students hurried to first classes. So I was surprised to see Izzy and Jean waiting for me when I exited the room. Neither of them looked well. Did you hear? asked Izzy. Hear what? About Danny. Uh, all I know is he wasn't in home room. Right. Because his brother was killed in Vietnam. Izzy spun away after he spat this out, very upset. You serious? Yep, said Jean. Duffy heard it from a girl who's friends with Jamie. I guess Jamie found out right before her first bell and had a blubbering freak out right in front of the school. Holy shit. Happened like two days ago. Big ass ambush in some place called Faux Duck or something. Tom had been over there since 1966, for cripes' sake. 
No wonder Danny's always such a jitbag. Can't imagine if my older brother was in now what I'd be like. Gotta get to biology now, muttered Izzy, still afraid to look at us. Bye. Me and Jean had nothing else to add and went our different ways. I thought about Danny all the way through world history, physics, gym class, lunch, especially lunch, English, and economics. I was in a daze the entire bus ride home, through dinner, and through another sacrificial game of Clue with Robbie. Mom and Dad heard about Danny's brother by then because it was even on the local news, and were afraid to talk to me about it. I desperately needed to, but wasn't sure how. Calling Izzy or Jean seemed out of the question. Izzy was too weirded out by the war in general, while Jean was out of touch with any emotion except anger. I spent the next two days in a confused fog. Vietnam, a scary sideshow to my less important daily concerns, had suddenly been shoved into my life, and I quickly got why it had enveloped Helen. I tried to lose myself in early homework assignments or helped Robbie with some math, but nothing seemed to work. I even tried to call Danny's house, but hung up quickly when his dad answered, too unprepared to say a word. In the next evening paper, there was mention of a memorial service for Tom Blight scheduled for the following day, and I suddenly knew what I wanted to do. Late that afternoon, I waited until Mom was napping and Robbie was submerged in his baseball cards. I raided our kitchen cupboard and dumped an item into a paper bag, then jumped back on my bike and rode all the way to Collier Street. Except for a crop of lawn sprinklers, the neighborhood was quiet. The Blight House was flooded with many parked cars on both sides of the street and in the driveway. Through the front windows, I could see adults and a few kids in dark formal clothes stand around and speak softly. I laid my bike on the grass, walked up the drive and around the side of the house, stopped at the kitchen door and peered through the glass. Two anti-types in black finished giving Danny hugs and retreated to the living room. Danny slid his back against the dishwasher and lowered himself to the floor, holding a glass of what looked like ginger ale. It was odd to see him in a sport jacket and tie. I raised my knuckles and gently rapped on the glass part of the door. He looked up. His eyes were all watery. Once they focused and saw who I was, he quickly wiped them on his jacket sleeve, slowly got to his feet, and waved me into the kitchen. Hey, Danny. Hey, he replied, struggling to keep it together. Can you believe this crap? He set his ginger ale on the counter, wiped his eyes again. I'm real sorry about Tom, I said. I had no idea he was fighting in Vietnam. I thought he was just overseas. Vietnam is overseas. Right, but I thought he just had a normal job somewhere, like for some company. Anyway, just wanted to pay respects and everything. Thanks. You could have called me up and done that, you know. Oh, yeah, except my dad always says talking in person is better. I fidgeted a bit. Plus, I brought you these. I dug into my bag for an unopened package of Oreo cookies. Saw you eating those in the cafeteria once, so I figured he said nothing, but nodded a thank you and set the cookies on the counter behind him. Silence flooded the space between us again. At that moment, an attractive middle-aged woman entered the kitchen. She was also in black, clutched a tissue in one hand and an empty serving tray in the other. Hey, Mom, said Danny, and stood a little straighter. Hi, who's this? Joey, I said with a quick smile. Joey Tosh. Oh, with the big game. Right. I'm real sorry about Tom, Mrs. Blight. Thank you, Joey. It's been a very... Her sentence evaporated into thin air. Nice that you came. She grabbed a few empty glasses and went back out. We stood there with our hands in our pockets, unsure what to say or do next. Danny exhaled, took another sip of his ginger ale. He didn't seem to want to look at me. About that game we had, I began. What about it? It was so good that um, I talked to Izzy and Jean, and we think we should leave it as a tie. He finally looked at me. How come? Well, because it was such a close battle that both teams kind of won, right? Except that's not what happened. Yeah, but it's what should have. I mean, we're all starting high school at the same time, which is tough enough. And now this with your brother doesn't seem right for either of us to be cocky about a damn wiffle ball game. I guess, he said, mulling it over. How long will you be out of school? One more day, maybe. Already got a crap ton of homework to make up, and hopefully my new teachers don't suck. Mine aren't bad. He nodded, picked up his ginger ale and paused before sipping it. You want some? Sure. 
He found me a glass, poured some Canada Dry from a bottle in the fridge. Thanks. We drank together. He glanced into the living room at the gathering and sighed. You know that one-handed swing of mine? Tom actually taught me that. When we were younger, we used to play right in the middle of Collier Street. No kidding. Yep. He whooped me at just about everything. But after I learned that swing, I flat out began to smoke his ass in baseball. He got awful pissed and made my life even more hell. He gazed at the kitchen wall, laughed to himself. It was a miracle he let me help him with his models. Models? Yeah, a few were mine, but he had a huge collection, all types. He looked at me a second, then back at the wall. You want to see them? I was stunned for a moment. Definitely. He led me up a cool back staircase off the kitchen and into their joint bedroom. It was about twice the size of the one I shared with Robbie, and the first thing I noticed was a bunk bed in the corner. The second was the collection of car, boat, plane, and you-name-it plastic models filling every available table, shelf, and windowsill or hanging from the ceiling by invisible wires. Whoa, you weren't kidding. He motioned to the bunk beds. He always got to sleep on top because he was older. Suppose I'll be up there now. My eyes wandered to a big table in the corner that was covered with models of Frankenstein, Dracula, Wolfman, and other famous creatures. Holy crap, you guys did Aurora monster models? I used to love those things. I walked over and crouched for a closer look. Mummy's chariot. Me and Izzy lit this on fire once and rolled it down a hill. I helped Tom put all of them together. Before that, we were huge into plastic army men. We had a Civil War set with horses, cannons, big old bridges. That was always fun. He started to tear up again. I suddenly felt uncomfortable. These are wicked, Danny, but I should probably split. Got some physics to study already. Yeah. I put out my hand and he shook it without looking up. Thanks again for the Oreos. He let out another sigh, then gave me a firm pat on the shoulder. I guess you're okay after all, Tosh. I guess you're a minch. I think you mean mensch? Ah, oh, same thing. Danny would eventually go off to a small college in the Midwest the same time his family moved away, and he was gone from my world after that. Like Helen, he was a pivotal person in my life. Just being in his house that day was monumental, let alone the bedroom he shared with his lost brother. Beginning that summer, I learned how to handle all of life's change-ups. What's that, Robbie? My brother's home office was so filled with electronics that our calls often dropped or broke up. Hold on a sec. Through the phone, I could hear him lower the volume on the news show he was watching, then the dizzying clickety-clack of his fingers on a keyboard as he finished off an email. Sorry, bro. Year-end reports are roasting my butt again. He had been working for the same commercial real estate firm in Hartford for 26 years, five more than his childless marriage to Maureen, a social worker he met in college. Can you guys make it to my 50th? I asked. We're thinking late October in Chicago now. You know, halfway. Doesn't look good, Joey. Seriously? Sox making the playoffs have anything to do with this? Well, that doesn't help. So what's the reason? Oh, Maureen doesn't want to fly right now, at least for like nine months. I chewed on his words for a few seconds. Don't tell me. I'm going to be a dad, Joey. Thinking back now, I've come to believe we are all like human wiffle balls floating about on the winds of fate, unsure if a big drop or blast is coming, if we're going to be smacked out of sight or make it into a fielder's bare, sweaty hands without incident. When I left Danny Blight's house that day, I exited onto the driveway through the same kitchen door and caught a glimpse of his fenced-in backyard. It was getting dark, but I swear I spotted a small pitcher's mound and inched behind the house for a closer look. Like most of the homes on Collier, the blight backyard was enormous and flanked by tall elms and a few pines. Danny's dad had actually built him an entire home wiffle ball field to practice on. Plastic foul lines and little foul poles, real bases, a junior-sized pitching machine operated by a handheld remote control to whip one wiffle ball after another over an actual home plate. There was even a newly constructed and painted wood fence around the outfield, with 150 FT distances marked down the lines. I cannot believe what I was looking at. 
Someone else came out of the kitchen door at that moment, and I quickly hurried back around to the driveway. Biking home, my thoughts were an odd scramble of sadness and hope. I suddenly had a desire to play wiffle ball on Danny's amazing backyard field sometime soon. I sure wouldn't be afraid to ask him. You've been listening to The Porch Roof Classic by Jeff Pullman. Hope you've enjoyed this original podcast novel, and if so, please tell your friends about it. I'd like to thank Spotify for Podcasters and Buzzsprout for their recording and marketing help, to Jennifer Field for her spot-on porch roof artwork, and to all the people in my past who helped me populate this fictional creation. That's the ball game. If you enjoyed this podcast and would like to contribute, go to buymeacoffee.com slash jpolman54v. Thanks.